A recent report chronicles the contributions, if that's the right word, of the rich towards climate change. As we head towards yet another COP summit, what is the way forward? Far right wing politician Hurt Wilder's Freedom Party has emerged as the single largest party in the Dutch parliament. What led to this drastic rightward shift in the Netherlands? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. A recent Oxfam report says that the richest one percent of the world's population is responsible for as much carbon emissions as the poorest 66 percent. These are 2019 numbers and to make this clearer, let's look at the actual figures. 77 million rich people are responsible for as much carbon emissions as the poorest 5 billion people. Oxfam International's interim executive director said, and I quote, the super rich are plundering and polluting the planet to the point of destruction leaving humanity choking on extreme heat, floods and drought. We are soon heading for another climate summit in the United Arab Emirates this time and the impact of inequality within nations and between them will be a key point of discussion. We are joined by D. Raghunandan of the Delhi Science Forum for more. Raghu, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the Oxfam report, of course, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of details in it but proving one interesting point which is that it's maybe wrong to talk about uh, climate change and its impacts in a very neutral way as though everyone is affected uh, you know, uh, in a very similar fashion. And I think this report which talks about the impact uh, or, the, or how certain sections of the population, the rich are ca causing an impact is very different from what the poor are doing. So what, are your f what, is, what is your basic take on the report before we go into some of the details uh, related to this? You see, frankly speaking, uh, my broad response is it is correct to say that everybody is impacted by climate change. Uh, it's not as if the rich are immune uh, to the impacts and only the poor are uh, affected by the impacts. The point is that the rich are able to withstand the impacts better because they have other means by which to either escape uh, the impacts, go somewhere else, uh, or create better conditions for living which can enable them to withstand the impacts. But as we have seen uh, in the heat waves in North America uh, last year and this year, and accompanying droughts, they have affected some of the most affluent sections in California, uh, on the west, western seaboard of the United States, uh, in fairly uh, well-off communities in Canada. Uh, in Europe as well, the floods, for example, have affected northern Europe. Uh, a lot. And even though Southern Europe is comparatively poorer than the North, they have been impacted hugely by heat waves and drought. Uh, so it is correct to say that even the richer countries have been uh, impacted. But at the same time, the poorer countries have been impacted to the extent that survival has become a problem. And that is true of equatorial Africa, uh, of sub-Saharan uh, Africa and many parts of uh, South America and South Asia uh, as well, where uh, sea level rise uh, has threatened, prolonged droughts uh, have threatened as in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, which has prompted mass migration away from these uh, areas. So the impacts are differentially felt uh, by poorer communities compared to richer communities. That is indisputable. Right, Raghu, of course, the report also focusing really on contributions as well to, uh, you know, to climate change. And in that sense, 16% is what uh, the richest in the world are supposedly contributing and they're contributing as much as the, uh, you know, as much as, you know, hundreds of millions of people who are really poor. And this, I think, fundamentally poses a question that how do you sort of address this kind of a situation where a small part of the population is contributing so much to, uh, you know, to climate change, to the kind of, to emissions, for instance, whereas the bulk of the population is, of course, uh, are huge in numbers, but are not really responsible so much. So how do you sort of uh, address a crisis like this where a small segment of the population is so responsible? 
Well, Prashant, this has been uh, at the very heart of the uh, climate negotiations under the UN Framework Convention for climate change. Uh, the first thing to be noted is that what you just said speaks about current uh, emissions. Uh, but the climate crisis is being caused not by the emissions year on year now, but the accumulated uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which has been put there since 1850. And if you take that into account, then close to 75% uh, has been put there by the developed uh, countries uh, since 1850 to now. Whereas the middle income countries and the uh, developing countries put together are today contributing just over half uh, in current uh, terms. But once again, as I said, we need to keep in mind that the climate crisis is caused by historically accumulated greenhouse gas uh, uh, in the atmosphere, uh, where the contributions of the developed countries are overwhelmingly uh, higher than those of the developing uh, countries. At the same time, and for this reason, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in its global negotiations, including at Paris, which is the binding agreement that we are all uh, living through uh, today, has set itself the uh, framework or a, uh, a regime of uh, controlling uh, emissions by saying that the developed countries uh, will uh, uh, will achieve absolute reductions in emissions, whereas the developing countries will seek to slow down emissions rise. Uh, so we are looking at absolute reductions by the developed countries, while developed, developing countries will need to rise, keeping in mind our developmental needs, but slow it down compared to what it might have been otherwise. So that's the uh, way in which this differential between developed and developing countries is being dealt with. The problem today is that the developed countries, while they have peaked more or less and are on a trajectory of reducing their emissions, are not reducing fast enough. Right. Uh, and if they don't reduce fast enough, then we will not reach the targets that we have set for ourselves globally. And incidentally, this is also true of uh, some of the other countries which we don't normally classify as developed. Uh, for example, the Russian Federation uh, is a notable example. Uh, the oil producing nations of the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf, whichever you want to call it, is there, and China. Uh, are nations which have high uh, emissions and whose reductions are still not as fast as they should be uh, given the current conditions and given their own capabilities uh, to reduce their emissions. Right, Raghu, of course, all this brings us to uh, the coming COP summit uh, to be held in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, of course, this is now, I think over the past two, three years, it has really gained another level of significance, the media discussions around it. You know, the various agendas that are brought to it, people's organizations making a very powerful uh, statements in many of these uh, events at that time. So what do you see as some of the major challenges, uh, you know, as this summit approaches? Do you see that, do you see, what? where do you see some of the sticking points or where do you see some of the major discussions sort of taking place? Well, uh, from my point of view, I think the most important uh, issue before the uh, next COP, COP28, uh, should be uh, the global stock take, uh, which has occurred this year, uh, which has taken place this year. This was mandated in the Paris Agreement to come into effect five years from the year 2018. That brings us to 2023, which is meant to take account of where do we stand? All countries have pledged emission reductions, they've got their 
nationally determined contributions or NDCs to reduce emissions uh, compared to where the targeted emissions should be if we want to reach either 2 degrees C temperature rise or 1.5 uh, temperature rise. What uh, the global stock take has shown, uh, of, for which a technical committee has been set up under the uh, UN Framework Convention, they've had three sittings and that will be presented in a report mm -hmm. before the COP and that will determine new pledges to be made in the year 2025 within a year from now. So discussions should start now so that we arrive at new NDCs in the year 2025, which should set the trajectory. To me, this is the most important issue before the COP. Unfortunately, I don't think it will be. Uh, I think there will be about seven or eight issues which will sort of get equal attention, uh, which has been the trend over the last few years, including the financing of uh, adaptation measures, the financing for developing countries to meet mitigation uh, goals, as well as the new uh, loss and damage right. uh, fund. And a large part of the media discussions have been on these uh, areas, as well as on adaptation, which then gets again linked to financing from the developed uh, countries. My own perception is that if we don't target the global stock take and the emission reduction goals that we should discuss today so that we can arrive at a good target one year uh, down the line, I think we are going to be missing the wood for the trees. Uh -huh. uh, because if you look at financing, you look at the uh, loss and damage fund, we all know that these are currently much below the requirement. Uh, and the estimated requirements are even much higher. They run into uh, billions and maybe trillions uh, of dollars, uh, which is nowhere in sight. Uh, the problem is that the more we focus on those, the less we focus on the emissions, then this is the proverbial uh, problem of continuing to mop the floor while the tap is running. Right. Uh, unless we shut off the tap, we can go on mopping the floor, but uh, we are not going to be achieving much. That is what I think we need to watch out for. Civil society organizations, people's movements should also focus on these. I fully appreciate the concern for the least developing countries, for financial aid to cope with adaptation. At the same time, at least as much, if not more attention needs to be paid to ensure that developed countries reduce their emissions to the extent required. Right. Thank you so much, Raghu, for giving a very succinct analysis of some of the issues involved. And I think we'll come back to you soon for maybe a longer discussion, especially ahead of the COP summit. Sure. Thank you. Far-right-wing politician Hurt Wilders and his Freedom Party have emerged as the single largest force in the Dutch parliament, while the centre-right ruling party emerged third. Wilders is rapidly anti-immigrant and espouses harsh right-wing views on many social and economic issues. While there is some way to go before he forms a government, people in the Netherlands and abroad are already wary of the impact he may have as similar right-wing forces rise to power in Europe. We go to Anna for more. And as we often say on the show, a surprising at the same time, maybe not so surprising result. Uh, Herr Twilders has been around in the political scene in the Netherlands for the longest time. Uh, none of his slogans on uh, campaigns, campaign planks, none of his views or anything new as far as the Dutch public is concerned. But nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, securing what is a substantial victory as far as uh, these results are concerned, as, although there is much more to be done for him to form the government. So maybe for the benefit of our viewers, could you maybe take us through uh, who this person is and what really are uh, his uh, significant points of view or the direction he intends to take the Netherlands in? Well, as you said, Het Wilders has been around uh, in the Netherlands for quite a bit of time and he's notorious actually for his uh, very extreme anti-immigration policy, uh, for his extreme anti-immigration views, uh, for 
uh, for the anti-Islam stance that he uh, he he takes uh, in in the public spaces, and so he's been described by, by many as uh, the Dutch Trump or uh, in most recent times as the Dutch Millet. Uh, but uh, you know what uh, what his uh, discourse comprises of? It's uh, I would say in, in, at some points even a bit more extreme to to those of uh, to those of Trump. Uh, so essentially, what was not a surprise when we saw the results yesterday is the the avalanche of support that he got uh, on social media uh, through statements by other far right European leaders, including Orbán, including Matteo Salvini, uh, including Le Pen, uh, and uh, so essentially all this crowd who gathered around him and who seems to be very good pals with him. So uh, that's definitely a reason for concern for the Dutch public, for the people who have um, waited for the results of yesterday's election with a bit of trepidation, it has to be said, uh, because it was clear that uh, a shift was coming, but uh, it was very difficult to say at uh, um, until the very last moment uh, into which di direction this shift will, will go into. And so, you know, um, in addition to what uh, we have seen from the Freedom Party, which uh, is headed by Wilders, there was also an increase in the votes and in the seats gained by the by the Green Labour Coalition. So that's also something to consider uh, because it appears to be a bit of a shift from uh, what uh, what the people of the Netherlands have uh, been um, essentially looking at for the past uh, past, uh, past few government circles, uh, and that was being led by by a, uh, by a centre right uh, party. So. Apparently, there is a shift in that and uh, uh, an attempt to find an alternative. But unfortunately, that alternative has been uh, has been uh, very, you know, very, very right wing for uh, for Dutch standards. Yeah. And of course, in this context, uh, you know, multiple aspects you, you mentioned, of course, the immigration thing. He's also uh, seems very inclined to adopt austerity policies of various kinds, you know, also in favor of, I think, lower taxes, if I'm not mistaken and even cutting down on public services as well. So I think generally uh, not a, you know, as far as the economic side goes, it looks like difficulties lie ahead if he comes to power. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I think that's also so something that uh, that analysts pointed out uh, in, um, in in the last uh, weeks of uh, of the uh, of the campaigns, is that his uh, his approach was also shifting uh, from uh, topics which focus on immigration and which focus on um, so which essentially focus on on anti-immigration policies towards. Uh, addressing the topics that have been pointed out by people over the past months, uh, which include uh, extremely high uh, concerns about the cost of living crisis, about the housing crisis, uh, all of these things that uh, obviously people felt were not being addressed by the mainstream uh, political parties. Uh, he managed to kind of bring them up uh, and shift the view from what he was advocating for in, uh, in, in the field of immigration towards this kind of uh, economic set of policies. But what needs to be said also, and I think it was said uh, on several occasions in the Dutch local media, uh, is that uh, essentially while he was doing this kind of shift in public appearances, the program did not reflect it at all. So if you look at the program, it's still predominantly anti-Islam uh, anti policies being pushed forward at, uh, you know, at a very high, high rate. Uh, and while the Freedom Party, or Maybe it's better to say Wilders himself uh, has stated uh, after the the first results came in that he would uh, consider putting those on a shelf or putting those on a shelf for for a bit of time until he's able to form a coalition and form a government. Um, those are, you know, I mean. We have to say the truth, and you know the the European right wing parties they have some far fetched uh, ideas coming up, uh, but these are wild even for even for these standards. So we're talking about he was talking about a ban on the Quran, uh, a ban on building new mosques, um, extreme limitations to essentially bringing migrant families together. So for people who seek asylum in the Netherlands, who can then be reunited with their families, uh, it's uh, it's an extremely disturbing discourse uh, and it's an extremely di uh, disturbing discourse for those who have been uh, who have um, reached the polls yesterday and who have had hoped for for a better outcome of the of this election and also finally a quick uh, question as you mentioned some of the leaders of the european right also 
celebrating quite enthusiastically and there does seem to be i would you know you don't know if you call it a wave or something but in many key countries definitely a resurgence of uh, you know various right wing forces we know it's happened in italy we know uh, it's been happening in france for many years germany we've been seeing it as well and now we have the netherlands uh, not to mention of course countries like hungary and poland and all which uh, have always have consistently had that trend as well so what are the kind of issues around which you know what really is the perspective or the world view so to speak that these leaders seem to share in many ways well um, i mean the world view I, I think it's a bit generous to say that they have a world view uh, but uh, okay so uh, definitely something that uh, has been mount mounting up as being the key message of uh, of the european far, far right is that uh, of course immigrants are the main problem of the people of europe uh, and not the years and decades uh, for many of us who have lived through austerity which were were informed and supported by their representatives so a lot of these uh, a lot of these right-wing politicians uh, are essentially supporters of the same policies that put us uh, put us in in the place uh, where we are right now so that is you know talking about the cost of living crisis which is affecting people from the uk to italy to spain to all the places where the the right wing has uh, has gained power uh, and what needs to be said that there is no improvement seen there after they take power there is not an improvement in the quality of life of people who live in those in those countries it applies to people who have moved there it applies to people who were born there so there is essentially no difference the only difference is is that now there's this strengthening of hate speech against people who have done nothing wrong who have uh, you know uh, every right to 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 live wherever they want uh, and essentially, that's um, I think that's that's the main thing that they agree upon. Uh, the complete, yeah, non-existence of any other, uh, you know, uh, substantial program points uh, is something that uh, that should be said brings these people together. So it's uh, yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, of course, the first thing would be to see if he even manages to form the government. But uh, in case uh, they do so. Quite an alarming set of proposals, especially on the domestic side. Curious also on the international side. Uh, probably uh, they're pushing for a more isolationist policy. It seems, uh, you know, especially uh, leaving the European Union. What is being called the Nexit is something I think they're considering as well. So, uh, very curious times ahead that way for the Netherlands. We'll be tracking that. Thank you so much for speaking to us. And that's all we have time for in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and follow us on all social media platforms.